Hey everybody, Matt Coville here. This is my home office where I stream when we're doing a Twitch stream. These are usually unscheduled uh, impromptu streams in which we talk about whatever, whatever is on people's minds, questions about MCDM or the products we work on or Dungeons and Dragons nonsense or movies or music. We listen to a lot of music. We sometimes, we watched all of Casablanca once uh, and I jumped in and commentated, commentated, commented. I commented on it and we just did, for instance, 13 hours, quite a lot more than that actually of the 1981 BBC radio production of the Lord of the Rings which is all on Twitch in uh, collections you can go listen to us listening to this amazing radio play together and me punching in and giving my commentary and sometimes reading excerpts from Tom Shippey's books on uh, Tolkien or uh, Chris Tolkien's books on the on the writing of the Lord of the Rings that stuff is super fun and I had tweeted about the fact that we were playing D&D at 20th level. And of course, people had questions about that. And so I thought, well, why not answer them? And it turned into a nice little chunk. We might do more stuff like this on YouTube, where if there's some really memorable story that I think you folks would get a kick out of, we will save it from being deleted by the Twitch algorithm and we'll upload it to YouTube. So this is the story of us playing D&D at MCDM. Um, James was out. Normally, James lives and works in New Jersey, but he was out here for the kick starter and so we thought well everybody's here and i've never i've never played or run DD at 20th level before the highest i think i ever got to was about 15th level and that was playing advanced dungeons and dragons that was a character that started at zero level so i he worked himself up from literally a farmer i think at that point and I was just curious whether or not the game was fun at 20th level or whether things fell apart. And there's some received wisdom online about this stuff. But we played and we had a blast. And I thought you folks would like to hear how it went, even though it wasn't wasn't a campaign. It wasn't even an adventure. It turned out to only be like a part of one encounter. But that wasn't because we weren't having fun. We were actually having quite a lot of fun. It was just because of our schedule. We didn't get started till about 2.30 and we had a we had a dinner reservation. So this is the story of MCDM playing 5th edition at level 20 and how it went. I hope you folks get a kick out of it. How was running level 20? It was awesome, actually. I really liked it. We only played two rounds of combat. We only played two rounds of combat, but I, I, it was not, there was, I had no difficulties. We had no difficulties running or playing at 20th level that weren't the result of, I've never seen this 20th level character before. What does this do? <laughs> right and uh, everything else was just it's you know there's just the numbers are bigger the flat and math stuff seems to work the action economy seems to work so that was cool all space 33 well i like that stuff i, I don't know why like I, I we didn't have anybody cast wish nobody was playing a wizard but uh, um it was fun it, it, it you know uh james made characters for everybody it was james Jerry got to play, which was awesome. Um, I really like Jerry as a player, actually. Um, Jerry got to play. I don't know why that should be strange. He and I are almost exact contemporaries, uh, both chronologically and geographically. Um, and uh, so it was, it was me as the dungeon master. It was, it was Jerry. Jason has now our art director. James, the lead designer. Uh, Grace, artist. Lars. QA director. So it's five players. James made con uh, things for all of them. Characters for all of them, 20th level characters. Jerry was playing a halfling monk. Jason was playing a human cleric. James was playing a human beast master, his own class. Grace was playing, I think maybe a human talent or an elf talent. I don't remember what her, her ancestry was. And Lars was playing a human storm cleric. And, um, this is only this is Jason has now is only second time playing and it was awesome. And I bought an adventure, which I actually found people suggested it on Twitter, but I got so many suggestions on Twitter and there's so many, including an adventure that seemed like I got a lot of positive. A lot of people recommended it from my friend Jess Heinig, and which I only saw those comments after. And I was like, oh, that would have been cool to run Jess's adventure. I like that guy. Um, former former mage developer, former Star Trek developer. And, but it was the fires of Ishk was the one I ended up getting. And I got it off of adventure lookup, adventure lookup. I just said, you know what? These suggestions aren't giving me these suggestions I'm getting on Twitter. Aren't actually giving me enough information to make a decision. So I just used adventure lookup and it fucking worked like a dream. And I was like, okay. And it narrowed it down. And I was like, these look cool. And I was like, fires of Ishk, that seems cool. And I, I went and bought it and I, I, I thought it was really well done. I, I really, um, I really appreciated the author's commitment to making it so you don't have to read this adventure ahead of time. Each page is an encounter and what you need to know is on that page. 
Um, I don't think they got 100% of the way there, right? I think they got, but I, I, I don't, I, in other words, I don't think they got an A plus, but I do think they got like a, I, definitely in the, the solid B, maybe a B plus, really well done, I thought. And it's a adventure that takes place on the elemental plane of fire in a volcano. Well, I, and you start outside the volcano and you have to go into the volcano and there's a dungeon in the volcano. It's only a couple of rooms. And I relocated it to the big island of Ix. That's why I'd spent most of my time in prep doing was was relocating, was re, reskinning the adventure for my world. So I moved it to the big island of Ix and I decided that they were going to fight Sithrion Aronazir, who I've never run before, Justice Armin designed. And Sithrion Aronazir is sort of the end boss of end bosses. We have several end bosses in the MCDM Legendarium, but Sithrion Aronazir right now is the end boss of end bosses. CR 26, 27, I think. I, Gazamok might get might might replace. I mean, God, I think you can be a higher. I think you can be a higher CR monster, but not be the end boss of end bosses. You can be tougher, physically tougher, but not as have you know. Gazamok doesn't have anywhere near as many special abilities as Sithrion or Onazir does, and so I I actually wrote a little uh, thing. Um, so these were my notes. No, 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 notes. I I titled even though this was just a. I, you know, we were going to play for like, at most, we were going to play for four hours, but we got started late. So we played for about two and a half hours, which isn't very long. Um, but I still treated it like it was a, like it was real. I still treated it like it was real because uh, that's part of the fun for me. And the name of the uh, the name of this adventure that we were playing was Against the Worm of the World's End. It's a cool name, I think. It's a very kind of it's uh, it wouldn't be a, that wouldn't be a book in the Eternal Champion series, but it might be a chapter. And the first section was called the fall of Gazamok. You are gathered in a large round room. There is an orc paladin here in parentheses, the vile silencer, as well as a gray elf wizard parentheses, Imbris, and then her quote, labor Nostra, which is short for their short for the Sapphire skies. Um, motto, which is, um, I believe labor Nostra is, I believe their motto is we labor in secret. Um, and that's a longer phrase and that's the short of it. And I just put those in there in case, in case the players decided they wanted to talk to these people. Right. Um, I wanted to remember like there's a large conference room table here as well, as well as many bookshelves lining the walls and near the West wall is a large pool of milky white fluid. This is the first time I had run for James. First time I'd run for grace. Uh, near the West wall is a large pool of milky white fluid within you just saw. So there's like, again, some of this dramatic irony that I love where, the characters understand what's going on, but the players don't, right? Within, you just saw images play out, showing a battle between two titans. The images fade. The pool becomes solid white. There is a moon elf hovering near the pool. You each feel a sudden pressure on your heart, as though something deeply unnatural has happened in the world. The moon elf's eyes open. They are solid white. The titan of Ix has failed. Unix Kishquitl awakes. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> it produced a that produced a suitably appropriate. And once again, it probably took me about 45 minutes of research to get that word. Unix Kishquitl awaits. This is the end. All hope is lost unless you can reach the heart of the world and stop the end of time. That's the quote from the Moon Elf inside the sapphire sky how are you going to get from capital to ix 1500 miles away and lars raises his hand and says i cast gate and i went oh shit and and i was like wait a minute gates and ninth level i said first of all how does that work and he goes a fucking gate opens up to anywhere i want somewhere else on this plane another plane if i want to i could name someone and they will step through the gate i could summon them and i was like that's a ninth level actually it was james was like that's a ninth level spell and i was like do you want to cast a ninth level spell just to get to just to get to the start of the adventure. And he's well, actually, and then Lars said something I'll, I, I love him for. He was like, wait, hang on a minute. <laughs> hang on a minute. Wait a minute. Hang on a minute. Wait a minute. What's what's the difference between why would I cast gate when I have plane shift? <laughs> and I was like, Lars, you were not the first person to ask that. And the answer is that both of those spells were going to be in fifth edition at those levels before they had any idea what their design was because it's a legacy product. Uh, and it's more important that plane shift is there in its seventh level and gate is there in its ninth level than that. They both make sense in terms of, you know, um, player options and, and choosing spells and whatnot. 
because it's very un- I think it'd be very unusual for someone who was actually trying to maximize their high level spell slots that they would put they would pick gate over plane shift. I, there are reasons to do it, but generally speaking, I think you'd, there are better uses for your ninth level spell. That's what Lars was discovering. Many other people have discovered that before him. And so he casts plane shift twice. He shifts to another plane and then shifts back. So maybe that's the reason. But he had a lot of seventh level spell slots. And they arrive at the base of Unique's Kishkoidal. The and these are my notes. They don't know this. In fact, they never found this out. The volcano known to the Ixians as the heart of the world. And then in quotes, I put, "This world has many hearts." What does that mean? I don't know. Who spoke? Who's supposed to speak that? I don't know. I just wrote that. I just Gazmok lies dead, melted. And now some of the players at the table, like James, know who and what Gazmok is, and they were like, "What?" And I said, "You stand on the slopes of a great volcano, and that they're aware. They're aware that while they're here." I, they, first, they went to the plane of fire. Lars took Lars took them to quintessence. Lars took them first to alloy and then back. So I got to describe alloy briefly, right? And then they come back, and that was cool for me because I knew that this volcano, specifically the interior of the volcano, is technically on in quintessence. Uh, and so Lars uh, is aware that like those of the presence when he arrives back on the big island of Ix, he is aware of the fact that they sort of haven't left quintessence it's like i said it's like an embassy it's like an embassy of quintessence here in orden and lars uh, once again raises his hand and says i cast true resurrection on gazamok <laughs> and james was like what and i was like holy fuck and then he's like wait a minute hang on a minute i cast resurrection on Gaz. wait a minute wait a minute how long has he been dead <laughs> <laughs> right you don't need true resurrection his body's right there dude <laughs> like and so i had no idea never in a million years occurred because i that was part of the fun for me of of running a 20th level adventure at 20th level like not not having played 20 levels to get there i have no idea what the players could do i didn't want to know i wanted to be surprised i wanted to just invent and i want to take this adventure these encounters really these encounters and then wrap it in a little micro adventure and put challenges in front of them like how are you going to get there i just assume you're not your 20th level there must be a way for one of you assholes to get from capital to x it's got to be possible right um and it was it was there was probably several other ways they could have done it they had a warlock you know they they had a talent um and I didn't, I didn't occur to me that they were going to interact with Gazamok. I was just trying to, I was just trying to establish the stakes. Like I was just trying to establish how tough is the thing they're going to fight. They're going to fight a creature that just killed the Titan of Ix, right? And the idea that is each region has its own defender. Thor Xanatos, sorry, Thorn Xanthos was Gazamok's soul, willing and able to return. Oh, yeah. And so it was awesome because um, Gazamok rises and uh, comes back with one hit point. And I mean, God, if, for, if in your mind, when you're thinking of Gazamok, just imagine Godzilla, right? Uh, and so, but uh, Gazamok is the defender of Ix, and this is the big island of Ix. Ix is an island chain. And so when I was like, oh, he's back at one hit point, I said, okay, well, the first thing you see happens is he howls at the sun and the jungle because they're at the base of a volcano that a volcano is they're like, you know, a thousand, thirteen hundred feet in the air. Um, and there's another nine thousand feet of volcano above them. And so they can see the the island, a big island of Ix. And it's a massive jungle island, like forest, like jungle primeval kind of jungle. And Gazamok howls and the jungle starts to wither. And he draws in the island, gives him life and he's back at full hit points. And James, he ignores the heroes. The heroes are gnats to him, even at 20th level. And James is beast heart. Bebo, I think his character's name was, uh, or beep bow Bebo, uh, uses one of his abilities. I think he, I think it was literally animal handling and they made a joke of it. They made a joke of like, Hey, somebody use animal handling on this thing. <laughs> Like James in she said, I'm going to try and talk to Gazamok. I was like, okay, what skill are you going to use? And I'm like, what happened to diplomacy? I missed diplomacy. I'm like, ah, it's persuasion. I'm like, okay, I like diplomacy better for whatever reason. Persuasion is probably, I, I, it's probably me being old fashioned. Persuasion is probably better for it. Um, there's plenty of ways to use your charisma to convince somebody to do what you want. That's, that's as it should be. And so I was like, what's, what's diplomacy? And, and that was when Lars was like, uh, use animal handling, which we all laughed at. And James was like, well, as it turns out, <laughs> I can't, my, at this level, my beast heart can use animal handling to, to speak to monstrosities. 
um, and negotiate with them, speak their language. And so he he makes a connection to Gazamok and tries to convince Gazamok that they're allies. And it works. He rolls, he gets like a 27. And so Gazamok, I'm trying to just think of Godzilla, right? Gazamok turns and he sees the heroes, this tiny little band of humanoid adventurers, and he breathes on them. But his breath is this rainbow color and it wards them. It wards them against being um, interdimensionally fucked with. Um, because I think there's at least one ability Sithrion or Ronazir has. Actually, I think like what I what Gazamok was protecting them against was if Sithrion or Ronazir succeeds, like Sithrion or Ronazir contains dead universes inside her. And uh, that's where a lot of her power comes from. And it, so they were warded from getting drawn into Sithrion or Ronazir's um, universe. And but basically they couldn't be plane shifted or any of the other stuff. And so then, then I had this whole, I had this whole, you know, there was six or seven encounters, all of them pretty short. Um, I think we could have got that adventure done in a day if we'd started at 11 in the morning, but, uh, we didn't, we didn't get started till like two 30 and we had a dinner, dinner at six that we had to leave it for five 30. So we had about three hours to play. And so, um, it was cool because once now that Z- Gazamok was there, I just said, Oh, well, awesome. Gazamok. I said, well, they're like, we're going to my Jason was like, we're going to go get to go to Arby's, get some lunch. I'm like, Oh, I'm starving. Get me a, and he goes, and we're going to stop at comic quest. And I said, if you go to comic, quest, I was like, Hey, where's the sit through on her own is your mini. And he's like, well, Matt, I wish you would ask me a half an hour ago before I left my house because there was like eight of them there. And I'm like, well, what about the one we had here? He goes, you broke it. <laughs> and I'm like, that's true. That was the prototype, by the way. It was a very expensive prototype to break. And I broke it because I was trying to barricade Jason into the bathroom. <laughs> and I and I grabbed his uh he has like a, 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 a workbench, a big, heavy craftsman workbench on wheels. And I grabbed it and I was trying to wheel it in front of the door so he couldn't open the door and sit through on a run as he was sitting on there. And I was in such a hurry and it went boop and fell onto the floor and, psh, and I went, ah, ah. and uh, I was like, well, where are the pieces? And he's like, actually, that's a good question. He could be, they're probably at home. And I was like, well, that doesn't do me any fucking good. Um. So I said, while you're at Comic Quest, buy the biggest dragon they got. And it disappointed me because Lars is like, well, there was a bigger dragon, but it had five heads and it had like rainbow colors. And it was kind of stupid. And I was like, oh, you could have bought Tiamat. Just buy, just why? And so he got not Tiamat. All right, fine. But I was like, well, we're not getting started. We didn't get started till like 2.30. And so I thought they're not going to they're not going to get to the big dragon encounter. Right. Which in the adventure, the fires of Isk is a ancient red dragon. But for my purposes, um, Sithrion or Onazir is cooler. It's ours. And I got to run her. And so uh, with Gazamok in the party, they got to skip directly to the end because Gazamok could switch his breath weapon and go and turn it into like a plasma beam, right? Like it's it's like a it's like a uh, opening to the surface of the sun. And this beam of plasma just cores its way into the heart of the volcano, big enough for Gazamok to walk through, right? And so they're in the caldera, in the boiling magma caldera of the heart of the world of Enix Kishkohidl. I remembered it without looking at the word. Um, <laughs> that means it's real now. Uh, Got they got to fight Sithrion or Onazir in this magma, and it was awesome. It was super cool. The first thing that happened was she summoned the black rock, which is um supposed to it's it's a it's a terrain feature, right? It's a villain action. Um, I actually did her villain. No, I, I it was a legendary action. I used her legendary action to summon that, and then I used her first villain action, sort of out of order, and then um. The heroes mostly just got into melee, which is good because she has a lot of she has a couple of as long as you're within 30 feet, then this thing happens. If you're close to her, bad things happen to you. If you try to do something when you're close to her, she can try to stop it, um, which is cool. She can she can she can send you forward in time. And so um, the Jason's warlock on his turn after after Sithron Ronazir had fucked with the party a little bit, um, he hurled her to hell warlock ability hurled to hell i think and he's like a portal opens to hell and she gets sucked into it for one round so she's gone for an entire round and the heroes can buff themselves or ready actions which is what they did they all readied actions for her to come back and i was like oh what does it say we hurled to hell what does it say and he read the description and it said something like to the uttermost depths of the multiverse there was it was some it didn't i don't think it explicitly named hell 
right? It said something a little bit more evocative and a little bit more poetic and a little bit more, you know, um, a little bit more. It gave me a little bit more wiggle room. And I was like, oh, interesting. It was also cool because I told Jason, he's like, well, I'm a fiend packed warlock. And I'm like, oh, which fiend? He goes, what are my options? And I'm like, well, it's one of the archdukes of the seven cities. And I sent him a link to the MCDM wiki. And he goes, oh, it's Belial. I'm from the, sh- the city of shadow. And I'm like, that's fucking cool. Awesome. So I was getting into it. Like the players are getting into it. Right. And like, it's a real adventure. Like these are real characters. Like it's not a, it wasn't a danger room exercise. It was a real adventure. Right. Uh, just very short and truncated. And, um, by the way, I'm not checking chat. Is this story interesting? Am I doing, are, are you guys, are you guys like, we don't care about this, man. Talk about other shit. Okay, cool. Good. Sorry. Anytime I, anytime you see me not looking at chat, that's I'm all in the back of my head. I'm like, I hope things are going well. So, um, so I was like, Oh, okay. So hurled, hurled to hell. Awesome. And I described this portal opening up because I interpreted the, the, the the uttermost depths of the multiverse or the or the, or or whatever it was, whatever the actual phrase he used was, I interpreted it in my own way. And I said, this uh, portal opens up and this giant, you ready for this? You guys are going to fucking love this. Your giant, the, a giant mummified hand reaches up and grabs Sithra on her own ear and pulls her down. Right. And Jason's like, when she comes back, she takes all this fucking damage. Right. Um, and it was psychic damage. And Sithra on her own ear is vulnerable to psychic damage because the crystal dragons are psionic. They are psionic. So psionic stuff used against them cause they're made of their crystals are psionic crystals. And so psionic energy used against them sets up these sympathetic vibrations that interferes with them. And uh, so I was like, oh, that's cool. And so she's gone for a round. And I think I think the mummy hand might have said something. Yeah, it was I. Yeah. <laughs> Through the lower planes. Yeah. Thank you. Be, be schwaz. BS, BS Schwaz. Um, I think Corsica for the infinite might have said something. Uh, I think he said something like, uh, no time. And no, he like, what he said, he said, he said, no, this world is mine to end and pulled her into the abyss. The, uh, the, uh, the abyssal wasteland is what it's called in my world. And so, um, the heroes all ready a bunch of actions A round goes by. She comes back. They all, they do about, they do about 300 points of damage to her. Just beating the shit out of her. Um, Grace used four sorbs. And of course, that gave me the opportunity to say four sorbs in seven years ago. Which is my, my new favorite joke. And um, then she took a shitload of damage and it was doubled. And the heroes really liked that. But when she came out of the when when she came back out of the portal, I had it. I showed her like flapping her wings and breathing psychic fire down into the end. And she says something quippy to Corsica, like things should stay dead. Right. Something simple. And um and then at that point, I think Lars did something cool. I don't remember what it was. And I think that's where we ended it. Uh, I think that's where we ended it. Because at that point, we had played two rounds of combat and it was time to um, harm. That's right. Did you did you wait? wait did you cast harm? No, she decided to save, didn't she? Because you, you guys had cast a bunch of spells on her that had saving throws, but they all just did damage. And I was like, I'm pretty sure these guys have spells that are going to be nastier than that. So I'm going to save my legendary resistances. Did you hit with harm? Does harm just do damage? I guess it doesn't. Harm doesn't do what he used to do. I sent, I didn't send Jason through dice. I thought I sent, uh, no, I didn't send Jason through time. That's right. She used um, delay on uh, what's his bucket on James's on, on Bebo on the, on the beast heart. So the beast heart blinks out and, um, grace made a metaphysics check to see, do I know what that is? Cause it's a sci- all these are psionic abilities. And I was like, yeah, like, um, she just added a whole shitload of plank lengths to his timeline. So, so he's gonna, he's just gonna be gone for six seconds and he's just gonna come back, but he will not experience those six seconds. That's right. I did a shitload of damage and it permanently lowered her max hit points. Uh, Sithri on her own ear is from Kingdoms and Warfare. And Jerry jumped on her back to ride her to ride her like a donkey. Like a bad, bad donkey. Oh, spank you. 
Yep, everybody had a good time. It was I-75. Everybody thought it was a lot of fun, actually. That was the impression I got was that was that was cool. If not for the fact that we're going to Din Tai Fung, we would we would just have kept playing. 